Okay, good afternoon. I think we will proceed. Welcome to all of you. My name is Joseph Kearney, as I imagine most of you to know, and it is my privilege as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to truly one of our favorite events of the year. It is always our favorite, but it's especially welcome this year because this is our first event in this room since we renamed it a few days ago as the Lubar Center after our great benefactors, Shell and Marianne Lubar. We look forward to many more Lubar Center events to come. This afternoon, of course, we have gathered especially to welcome into our pro bono society a substantial number of Marquette Law students, or for a more immediate term for some of you than for others, future Marquette lawyers. We have done an admission ceremony for our pro bono society for a number of years now. In fact, the pro bono society itself was established during the deanship of my predecessor, the late Howard Eisenberg, who served as dean of the law school from 1995 until 2002. The number of inductees has increased over the years, and you, the students who make these contributions, really inspire us. Over the past few years, we've also established a new tradition, which is to say the Posner Pro Bono Exchange. Through this, we honor the memory of another of our great benefactors, the late Gene Posner, a member of our class of 1936, who was a lawyer, entrepreneur, and philanthropist here in Milwaukee. It is right that we should honor him, and on this particular occasion, because much of our pro bono work has been supported by a multi-year gift from the Gene and Ruth Posner Foundation, which is led by Gene's grandson, Josh Gimbel, a lawyer with Gimbel, Riley, Guerin, and Brown in Milwaukee. In particular, the foundation has supported the expansion over the years of our Office of Public Service, which is led by Dean Angela Schultz and Director Katie Mertz. They have led us not only in preparing for this particular event, but far more broadly in working with the students over the course of the year on the pro bono placements. So I want to begin with my thanks to them. We'd also like to give you a little bit of a sense of Gene Posner, or in any event, a welcome from Josh Gimbel. I had the privilege of meeting Gene a number of times before his death in 2005 at the age of 90. I was able to get a sense of the man. I also think I get a sense of the man also from my relationship with Josh Gimbel, who is a terrific lawyer and wonderful supporter of Marquette University Law School. So, uh, Josh, if you would not mind uh, please coming up and saying a few words of welcome. Thank you, Joe, and congratulations on the naming. This is uh, a great uh, gift to your uh, great school. Uh, yes, my grandfather, Gene, uh, graduated from this fine institution in 1936, and uh, my father graduated from here in 1960. My brother graduated from this law school in 1984, and I graduated 30 years ago next month from the other law school in the state of Wisconsin, so uh, don't hold that against me. But I've uh, really grown to appreciate this school as much and more than my own uh, law school. Uh, my grandfather uh, was, like uh, Dean Kearney said, a lawyer, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, but he was always a lawyer first. And he taught me early on how important it was as a lawyer, because you hold a monopoly on providing those services, to give back to those who can't afford lawyers. And so he taught me early by bringing people in who didn't have money to give them legal advice that that was something... Uh, you really were obligated to do. And, and I've carried on that tradition. I've uh, often served at the Mo Milwaukee Justice Center. Some of you look familiar, and I might have worked with you, uh, but over the years I've worked with other Marquette Law students. And if my grandfather was alive today, he would be just so thrilled to see so many of you who have dedicated their time as law students to give back uh, to their community. And uh, he would be assured that because you have that skill set developed now, you're going to carry that on uh, when you practice law. Uh, so uh, I'm just thrilled to be here as always, and I look forward to hearing from uh, Mike and our guests today. And I just wanted to give a special thanks to Angela and Katie for all their wonderful work. I'm sure that all of you know them well and how dedicated they are. They're fine examples of what you should all hope to achieve. So. Thank you very much for letting me say a few words.
Thank you, Josh. We will proceed to the Posner Pro Bono Exchange itself. For this, our guest is Shante Parker. Ms. Parker is the Special Counsel for New Initiatives at the National Innocence Project. She leads the development of strategies to use the unique lens of innocence to address three problems, racial bias in the criminal justice system, the growing crisis in indigent defense, and how the system forces even the innocent to plead guilty to misdemeanors. Before joining the Innocence Project, Ms. Parker was a supervising attorney in the criminal defense practice of the Legal Aid Society in Brooklyn. She also served as a staff attorney with the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem and a felony trial attorney with the Orleans Public Defenders. Ms. Parker holds a baccalaureate degree from Spelman College and a law degree from New York University. She comes to us through a mutual connection with the SE Justice Group, a community of women with incarcerated loved ones based in California's Bay Area. Ms. Parker has provided considerable other public service as well. I would list some of it, but it scarcely seems necessary. She's here with Mike Goucher. So please welcome Shante Parker to this year's Posner Pro Bono Exchange at Marquette University Law School. Thank you, Dean Kearney, and uh, thanks to Josh again, and congratulations to all the students in the room, and, uh, and we're glad to have so many of their uh, family and friends with us today. Should be a great, uh, a great afternoon. Uh, Shante Parker, it's good to have you with us here. I'm at the... happy to be here. So honored to be amongst all of you students who've de dedicated so much of your time to public service uh, while you were in law school. So I, so I always like to begin these conversations with our guests and get some sense of, of why they became lawyers. And in your case, why well, you became a public interest lawyer. How did you get here? So uh, I got here, I wanted to be a lawyer um, because my aunt, she was a lawyer and she traveled all over the world. And so I, growing up in Savannah, Georgia, I really wanted to get out. <laughs> and so I saw that she was a lawyer and wanted to follow in her footsteps. And then when I got to law school, I was introduced to public interest law through clinical pro programs at NYU. I had a hard time with the first year classes and when I heard about clinics where you could actually go out into the community and represent individuals, I said, sign me up. And as soon as I did that, we were um, interning with the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem and it just made such sense to me to have a public defender office in the community and focused on representing people as whole people, not just the individual legal case. And so I was hooked after that. And so that's where I really got the spark to be a public interest attorney. It clicked pretty quickly when you experienced that. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I, I was reading a, a blog post that uh, Shantae wrote um, back, I think it was in November of last year. She was leaving her job with legal aid and about to start her job with the uh, Innocence Project. And, and I found it fascinating on a lot of levels. And, and mostly it was about why you really valued and liked being a public defender. Can you put into words what that experience was like for you? It helped me grow as an individual to be able to stand next to people who were sometimes at the lowest points in their lives. And I was able to sit with them, uh, have them, talk to me about what was going on with them and give them the sense that somebody saw them and saw what they were going through. And so that was an immense privilege for me to then go into court and then do battle uh, with the prosecutors, to do battle with judges, and to really be the voice for people who were, like I said, at some of the lowest points in their lives. I love that. I also um, was not very much of a public speaker when I was growing up and was pretty shy. You said in the blog you were literally terrified, terrified. of doing the job, of being a public de defender. Yes, it's kind of terrifying to stand in front of a judge uh, and have someone's liberty at stake and to have to, to, to perform and act and be courageous. And so it made me very nervous, but in some ways that's what drew me to the job because I felt if I could conquer that um, and stand up for someone else, then that would make me a much better person um, and, and just be something that I could be proud of and, and look back on and say, I did this. I want to take you back to uh, when you first started working in New Orleans. And in this blog post, you tell the story of, you know, being ready to, to go do the job and you're taken to, the, like one of the first stops is to the jail parish. 
What did you see there, and what kind of impression did that leave on you? Well, I, I, I want to start back a little bit further, because right after law school, I didn't go to public interest work. I went to a big firm in New York, mm -hmm. and I was making a lot of money. <laughs> and I read um, one of our alumni magazines at NYU, and Brian Stevenson, how many people know Brian Stevenson? He is phenomenal. He's an attorney in Alabama who represents folks who are on death row. And so he did this interview where he talked about his work. And I sat there in my law firm office and I said, what am I doing? I have this passion for public interest and I'm not using it. Uh, and so mm -hmm. uh, a law school professor said, Orle Orleans is hiring. Why don't you go down and check it out? So I flew down and they took me to arraignments, which is the first appearance for people who are charged with crime. And it wasn't at court, it was at the parish jail. And so immediately I'm like, this doesn't seem like what I've seen on TV, it doesn't seem like what I've seen in New York, in my clinic. Um, it was looked like a cafeteria, the elementary school cafeteria, cinder block walls, and there were rows of chairs lined up facing this stage. And there was a TV monitor in the front of the room. And we waited a little bit and then they brought out the people who had just been arrested within the last 24 to 48 hours. And these people were in orange. They were shackled at their hands and at their feet. And all of them were black people. Um, and I was immediately uh, struck with anger that I was in America. And this is what was happening to people who were being charged with minor things, marijuana <laughs> possession, um, all kinds of things. But the, this is what was happening to them immediately after being arrested. And at that moment, I knew, you know, whatever I had to do, I was going to do it because I was going to go down there and, and be a part of uh, changing the way that system worked because it just shocked and appalled me that that was happening uh, in this country. You described the, the experience uh, as rage-inducing. Yes. Interesting choice of words. Yes. I, I think that, that that rage has helped fuel me uh, in this work. Uh, you've got to have passion, you've got to have dedication because I went from a law firm uh, salary to a pretty low salary. Uh, so it wasn't for the money um, and it wasn't necessarily for the prestige or the thanks. Uh, it was really that passion and that passion was fueled by a rage and anger that this was happening uh, and that people were allowing it to happen. And I wanted to be a part of um, this, this wrecking ball that was going to just knock that system down or at least take a, a nice chunk out of it because I just didn't, didn't like what was happening to people. So it was rage inducing on the one hand, but rewarding on the other, terribly rewarding I would guess. Yeah, definitely. I think it was rewarding for me because I was able to see instant results. You know, I had 200 or so cases when I first started, so you're representing people uh, in individual cases and you get to see uh, them get out on bail because you argued. You get to see a not guilty from a judge uh, immediately. And then also it was rewarding because of the community of people that came down at that time and we really supported each other. And then living in New Orleans was a lot of fun. <laughs> when you had time away from work, which I'm sure wasn't, there wasn't a lot of that. We uh, made time. You made time, good, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, definitely. So one of the things you talked about were the, the lessons that you learned um, when you were a public defender. And, and I wanna walk through these. You had four lessons that you learned that you, you talked about in your blog post. The first one was be more empathetic. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to elaborate on each of these. What do you mean by being more empathetic? What I mean by be more empathetic is to just understand where your clients are coming from. To understand, and, and it's a little bit different from sympathy because you know sympathy is more like feeling sorry for someone in their situation. But empathy, I think, is really allowing yourself to step outside of your individual background and, and the, what you bring to the table and try to put yourself in that other person's shoes, right? So at arraignments, understanding that someone may have just been yanked out of their house, didn't get a chance to get dressed. And so if they're not really communicating with you, you gotta slow down a little bit and understand where they're coming from, that they just met you, that you need to take it slow, that you need to make sure you're asking your questions clearly, that you may need to give them a chance to just vent for about five minutes before you get into the rapid fire questions that you need to ask. So that's what I mean when I say be more empathetic because this job 
as a public defender. There are a lot, lots of things coming at you, I think, in any public interest job. Not a lot of resources, and there's a lot of problems you've got to solve. But you've got to be able to slow yourself down in those moments when you're talking to clients and when you're working with them to really understand where they're coming from and also understand that what you think is important might not be the most important thing for them in that moment and trying to uh, manage where they're coming from. How long did it take you to, to learn that, that empathy skill? Mm, I think that's something that's in my personality from mm. um, as long as I can remember. I'm a middle child, so I was always the, <laughs> the mediator between my sisters. I could like understand where my younger sister was coming from, <laughs> being the baby and wanting everybody to see her point of view. And I could also see where my older sister was coming from, so I was always I think, had that quality, so it was just a natural fit. A, a second lesson you learned, that redemption is for everyone. Yes. What do you mean by that? I just mean that, um, I'm going to go back to Brian Stevenson, I love him, and this, I, he says this, and I think actually a, a nun, Sister Helen Prejean, said it first, but that we are not um, as bad as the worst thing that we've ever done. And that, I think, is just a core value that then flows to if we aren't as bad as the worst thing we ever done, because we've all done things that we wouldn't want anyone else to know about um, because we feel so ashamed of that moment. Uh, but we have to be able to move through that and understand that that's not who we are. It doesn't define us. And we have the opportunity to live a life that redeems us and makes us whole again, that we paid whatever debt we, we owe to uh, whatever situation that was, and we are allowed to move forward. And so I think that that's a core value for me. It was a core value as I was a public defender to sort of see my clients as more than the charge, uh, more than their records. And that's got to be the way that it is, uh, or else we'd all just be <laughs> walking around um, kind of in the dumps uh, because, you know, life, life can throw things at you. and you can have some challenges, but you've got to be able to, to walk past those and not uh, carry that weight forever. The third lesson, be bold and courageous in all that you do. In other words, act. Yes. That was, I, I, that was an interesting observation, act. Yes, I think I got that from New Orleans. Like Again, going there and being in this place where there was such injustice uh, on a daily basis, um, I just, had to act, so I had to speak up at a bail hearing. Uh, I had to object, I had to research, I had to go to the jail and see my clients. And so that was just something that, um, for me, was really important. Like you can, we can all have the best intentions, we can all think uh, about how much we'd like things to change, but unless we all step up and act, um, as you all know, you, you guys stepped up and act, um, in, in giving these pro bono hours, then, then nothing changes. So I think it's very important to, to push past your fear mm -hmm. uh, and really, really act when, when you need to. The final lesson is, is care more about the people we serve. And, and I thought that was some, I really like to hear your perspective on this because I would think that as a public defender or if you work in the DA's office, for instance, there can become almost a sameness to the cases. You can become cynical. You can become, you, you do cases almost by rote. Mm -hmm. The passion's gone. Mm -hmm. um, how do you combat that? How do you care more? Mm -hmm. It's hard, yeah, I will tell you. Um, you have to slow down. I think the volume of cases can really make you, we, we create these shortcuts in life when we know we've got to get through a lot of things and so you may create this shortcut. I know this kind of client with this kind of case will get this kind of result and so I can just zip right through this. And so I really, I, I always um, told my attorneys at the Legal Aid Society when supervising is just to slow down, take some time to just talk to somebody. If you've only got 30 minutes with them, use five or 10 of those just to have that person engage with you and you listen to them uh, without you trying to sort of solve the problem or think about you know what's the next step, just to slow down. And so uh, I think it's really important that if we all cared more about the people that we served, 
um, we wouldn't have as much injustice as we as we have. You, you say that you were very proud, proud to stand with every yeah, client you had, every no matter what the crime they were committed yeah. right? or, or, or charged with. <laughs> you know, it's funny, last night um, I was having dinner and was talking to a gentleman next to me and talked to him about being a public defender and he asked me about, you know, what's the worst case? And I could recall, you know, uh, a case that was pretty difficult. But in those moments when you are tasked with representing someone who everyone else in the courtroom, and I mean everyone from the judge, the district attorney, the court officers, the spectators, everybody is looking at this person as if they are uh, the scum of the earth. In that moment, that's when I felt most proud and I feel like I got my real public defender stripes because that's what our system is built on, right? That, that no matter what you're charged with, you have the right to have an attorney to represent you. My job is to stand there and represent that person to the best of my ability. My job is not to convict, that's the prosecutor, and if they're doing their job, they're gonna get it done, you know? Um, and so, so I have been proud to stand by each one of them because I believe even in those moments when it's a difficult case. Um, I'm defending the Constitution at that moment in, in, in addition to defending an individual. So you worked in uh, New Orleans and in Brooklyn yes. and in Harlem, yes. I believe. <laughs> but now you're working for the Innocence Project, and I want to talk about the focus of your work today. What are you focused on? Yeah, so I'm focused on some really big issues, race, <laughs> which is very uh, an intractable issue in our country, uh, indigent defense, and people who plead guilty to misdemeanors they didn't commit. And, and tell us a little bit more about the Innocence Project, just in case people in here are not as familiar with it. Sure. Uh, so the Innocence Project was founded about 25 years ago by uh, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, uh, two men who represented O.J. Simpson. <laughs> and back then, they, they saw that DNA testing could be used to show that people didn't commit crimes that they were convicted of. So that's been our primary focus for the last 25 years, is doing exoneration. So people will write us and say, I didn't do this crime. There's DNA. I need you to find it and test it. And so we'll do that. And we've exonerated over 300 people in that time. Uh, and also done some policy work, so trying to get laws changed. Once people are exonerated, there's not a lot that they get, right? They get tossed out on the street. Um, they're not even on parole, so they don't get the benefits of those services. So we try to change the laws around compensation. We try to prevent uh, wrongful convictions by passing laws around um, um, lineups to make sure that the process is fair um, from the beginning so we can prevent the wrongful conviction. When you talk about race, mm -hmm. uh, my gosh, what a, what a big issue to try mm -hmm. and get your arms around. What do you hope to accomplish when you focus on that? What, what can you change? Because it is such a big uh, issue. Yeah. You know, I think that for me, race is difficult because it's a concept. Right? It's, it's a concept in people's mind that uh, when they look at individuals, either uh, as police officers or prosecutors, or even defense attorneys, and they make assumptions about people given their race. And then systemically, we have policies that uh, disproportionately affect uh, certain people. And so I think that in order to really understand how to tackle it, we've got to talk pretty clearly about it and say, this is what's going on. We know from, you know, we look at how many people have been exonerated, their race, uh, how many people are incarcerated in their race. And so we know that there's a problem there, sort of just understanding and speaking very directly about it. Uh, and getting people to understand that, you know, it is something that we need to address. Um, so I've been thinking about how to do that from the Innocence Project's perspective, and it's difficult, um, but I'm excited about the challenge uh, because I think it's really important. I think if we can start to have conversations locally uh, around the issue, whether that's in prosecutor's office, whether that's in uh, police departments, uh, in courtrooms, to just say this is an issue, and how can we uh, prevent so many people from coming through the system uh, at this rate. You made an interesting comment earlier about New Orleans mm -hmm. and when you walked into that parish jail yeah. and you saw the people who were in that jail and they were African American. Mm -hmm. Is that the exception or is that the norm in America today? You know, I think that's the norm. And what does that say about the system? Yeah. 
All I can say is I think that's the norm from my perspective, from where I've worked. Um, and now at the Innocence Project, I'm starting to look at data all across the country. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is that in a lot of places around the country, I was looking at what's happening here in Milwaukee as well, right? 62% um, was the number that came up of black men or men who are incarcerated or will have some sort of contact um, during their adult lives. And so I think that tells us something, right? It's not a Southern problem. It's not a Southern problem. It's not a city problem. And even if, um, you know, you look at who's in your system and it's not a lot of black folks, we've got to look at, well, who's there? Are there? These are people who are on the margins of society. These are people who are living in poverty and we're, we're criminalizing their status. And so it's a problem that we've got to address because I, I think it's, it's endemic to the entire country. I want to spend a, a couple minutes on this um, notion that there's a growing crisis mm -hmm. in indigent defense. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Shante before we began, and about a year ago we had Matt Desmond, who wrote this uh, new Pulitzer Prize winning book, Eviction, uh, here at the law school. And he talked a lot about what he saw mm -hmm. uh, when he would go to court and he would see people who were being evicted, mm -hmm. and they had no legal counsel, no legal representation, and, and landlords did. It's just sort of the way it worked. How serious is the crisis that you see in indigent defense? I think it's pretty serious. I think there are probably uh, very few jurisdictions where the defense uh, attorneys get the same pay, get the same resources, um, are on equal footing as the prosecutor, and I would say that's probably in D.C. <laughs> at the Public Defender Service. Uh, everywhere else, you're going to see a, a, a difference, a disparity in the, the starting pay for public defenders, um, the amount of um, investigators they have, the amount of resources they have, and they're probably going to be doing a whole lot more cases than the prosecutor's office. There are some places in this country where there aren't even public defenders. People can get arrested and they can come to court and have to negotiate whether they're gonna take a plea, what's gonna happen in their case with the prosecutor. And that just, again, that's not the system that I learned about in law school. That's not the way that uh, we as Americans sort of have bought into this idea that this is the way our system works. That, that's not right. Um, and that's not constitutional. And it's just not fair and just. So I think that it, there is a crisis because um, for whatever reason, our systems don't value um, the defense, and so they don't put the resources where they need to be. Uh, I want to talk to you about a couple of other things that you're doing, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Dean Kearney mentioned them, but talk to us about the SE Justice Group. What is that, and, and why are you serving on the board of directors? Why is that important to you? Yeah. So SE is a sisterhood of women with incarcerated loved ones. So. Uh, these are women who are mothers, sisters, grandmothers. They have someone who is incarcerated. Uh, and I joined that board because a friend of mine started this organization. She saw a need for it. And I related to it because I often found that some of my best relationships with my clients came through my relationships with their, the women that loved them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I couldn't, you know, give those women the kind of support that they needed. They were going to the jail, they were talking to my clients, they were providing them with that, that emotional support, uh, but there was no one there holding them up. It's very stressful to have someone incarcerated uh, because that, that means that you don't have that financial support, perhaps, of the person in the home. You don't have this emotional support, and you've got to hold everything up on your own. Uh, so I love the idea of being able to provide these women with a community where they could connect, because a lot of them are isolated, right? You don't tell someone right. at your job, my son got arrested, and we're going through the courts. Uh, so to be able to connect these women to each other, and also to show them that they had some power Right, that the pain that they were going through, they could transform that into power. So we do healing with them. And then we also make them advocates for issues that touch their lives. We take them to the state house where they testified about elder parole laws. We're doing a campaign in California against money bail. And so these women are there and they're talking they're about- They're empowering them. They're empowering, right? right. Uh, and they can, they can really put a face to the people who are paying the bail. So when the bail industry says, you know, we're hurting bail, um, bail bondsmen who are minority and women, 
our SE sisters can say they may be the face of the bail industry, but the insurance companies are making the money. And no, you're really hurting uh, women of color who are paying all this money for bail that, that really doesn't need to be there. I also want to talk to you about uh, something that you have felt strongly about and continue to do. Um, it's, it's something called Gideon's Promise. And so you're, what, you're still acting as a mentor and a trainer and a speaker with new public defenders. Yes. I'm sure that's a, that's a two-way street. They get a lot from it, but I'll bet you get a lot from it too. Yes, we, uh, Gideon's Promise convenes every six months, which is really good because, you know, very quickly when you're in the grind uh, in a public defender office, you can get worn down and get jaded. So to be able to come back every six months and see these new public defenders who are really excited to get into the work, uh, that energizes me. And to hear them talk about why they're coming into the field um, just makes me excited and makes me remember why I started this work in the first place. Uh, so I love going back to work with them uh, and, and to continue to build this community of folks who are committed to representing people holistically and um, bringing some pride and some joy to the, to the field of public defense. Uh, I want to have you speak sort of directly to the students here in this room um, because um, you know, and we'll go full circle here. You mentioned that at the start of your career, you were at this private firm and you were making some good money. And my guess is there are a lot of students in this room who in their heart know they want to do public interest law. That's where their interest lies. Uh, and yet they weigh the cost of a college education. They weigh the fact that sometimes public defenders, most times public defenders are not paid a lot of money. Yeah. They wrestle with all of that. What do you say to those students? I would say that you really have to sit with yourself and understand what's most important to you. Um, because for me, what was really important was getting up and doing something that I felt passionate about, that I could go home at night and say, I feel good about what I did today. I helped people today. And that can come in a lot of different ways, right? You can go into a private firm and be able to do some pro bono work at your firm. You may be able to write a check to an organization to support the work that's being done. That may mean you go and do the work on a daily basis in a public interest office. Uh, but it's understanding that what's motivating you and that if you have this desire to be a part of public interest work that you've got to figure out how to get connected to that work in whatever way you can. And you also said, and I'll wrap it up with this, mm -hmm. um, you said for uh, people of color, mm -hmm. nothing more rewarding than, yeah. than being a public defender, doing that kind of public service work. Yeah, I w I, it's challenging, but um, you know, I can only speak from my experience and the experience of the folks, uh, the people of color that I work with who are public defenders. It just feels really awesome to be able to come into a courtroom and stand next to your client and speak up on their behalf. Because not only are you fighting for them, but you're also uh, a symbol uh, to the rest of the courtroom of the power in the community. Right? In some places, you might be, you and your client might be the only people of color in a courtroom. And so I think that's powerful for your client to see you uh, as a person of color, especially for me as a black woman, to stand up next to them and to be capable and to fight and to not sit down. That's an education, not only for everyone in the room, but I think it's also a sense of pride, I think, for my clients, for them to see me fight for them. Shante Parker. Uh of the Innocence Project. Thank you very much for uh, spending time with us, and thanks for all that you do uh, to make the, uh, the criminal justice system a more just place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. So much of education involves learning from examples, and in order to do that, we have to have examples or exemplars, and Shante Parker, certainly you are that, and I'm very grateful to you for coming to Milwaukee to be with us this afternoon. Now we want to turn our attention directly to our students, 
still on their way or your way to becoming Marquette lawyers, they or you have already distinguished yourselves in the commitment to some of the best ideals of the legal profession. In particular, even while students, even while concerning yourselves with courses, including internships in the community, and even with the frequent need to find some remunerative work given the financial exigencies that law school and life impose, even in these circumstances, you have provided pro bono work. The students whom we honor this afternoon have met some rigorous criteria. You have provided at least 50, and in some cases, 120 hours of work that has been A, and this is, as I like to say, in the conjunctive, not the disjunctive. There'll be an and before the D. Uh, a, not for academic credit. This is really the way I am, Shantae, by the way, but <laughs> they're, they're used to it uh, at this point. Uh, a, not for academic credit or compensation. B, supervised by a licensed attorney. C, primarily legal in nature. And D, in the service of the indigent, those who otherwise lack access to justice, or a nonprofit whose mission is along these lines. I want to give everyone here a brief but reasonably specific sense of a variety of the ways that our honorees have gone about this volunteer work, or at least of the places and the projects. So here are some examples and some data that Dean Schultz has given me. At Legal Action of Wisconsin, six students worked with attorneys to prepare and file complete U visa applications for survivors of domestic violence crimes. At the Guardianship Clinic, 12 students helped families with an adolescent with a severe disability on the cusp of adulthood and in the need of a guardian to make medical decisions. This one is particularly close to my heart. At the Eviction Defense Project, led by Legal Action of Wisconsin, 12 students participated. This new project seeks to reduce housing instability for low-income Milwaukee County families, especially those with children. Students work alongside volunteer lawyers as they prepare clients for their court date by assisting with settlement negotiations, preparing written answers, and providing limited scope representation. At the weekly clinic held at the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of Wisconsin, 14 students, these numbers are increasing as we go here, assisted Chapter 7 debtors and those considering filing for Chapter 7 relief. At the Second Chance Expungement Clinic, 22 students participated, in one instance in a clinic at the Milwaukee Bar Association and a second held at the Milwaukee Area Technical College downtown. The purpose of the clinic is the help to people to get their second chance by removing one felony conviction from their record and thereby allowing them better access to the job market. At the Milwaukee Justice Center Family Forms Clinic, 57 students worked one-on-one -on -one with pro se litigants completing pre- or post-judgment family law forms. To give you a sense of this clinic, more than 1,900 people received assistance there in just the first quarter of this year. In the Domestic Violence Injunction Hearings Lawyer for the Day project, 69 students worked with 439 petitioners seeking domestic violence injunction orders. Our thanks to Quarles and Brady for its leadership of that project. So many of these projects, in addition to being in conjunction with nonprofits such as Legal Action of Wisconsin, also are in partnership with various law firms. At the Marquette Legal Initiative for Nonprofit Corporations, students worked with 104 nonprofits or organizations seeking to become nonprofits. These included, just to give a few examples, an organization assisting individuals in purchasing and maintaining homes in Milwaukee's Harambee neighborhood, a group assisting veterans in transitioning back to civilian life, an organization bringing books and literary, ser literary ser literacy services to inner city children, and a firefighter's honor guard. And then there is the Marquette Volunteer Legal Clinic or, as I've had to come to call it over the years, the Marquette Volunteer Legal Clinics. 
This past year, 171 Marquette Law students volunteered with the MVLC, working with an even larger number of volunteer attorneys to serve this past year 4,345 clients, 100 more than the previous year, the substantial majority of whom are living at or below 115% of the federal poverty guidelines. To bring that number home, that's just $18,300 annual gross income for a household of two, which is the average household size served by the MVLC. And all of this is not even an exhaustive list. Altogether, of the 183 students expecting to graduate next month, we're hoping for you too, <laughs> 99 or 54 percent will be members of the Pro Bono Society. That's a record. In the student body more generally, more than two-thirds of our students have participated in pro bono work at some point in their law school career. In terms of new pro bono society members, we have 110 inductees this year, almost three-quarters of whom are with us this afternoon. 50 hours constitutes a substantial amount of time to devote to pro bono work while in law school. We are so impressed and so grateful. And some, and some members of the group have achieved the additional distinction of providing 120 hours. In all events, warm congratulations, thank you, and kudos to all the new members of the Law School's Pro Bono Society. We will proceed with Angela Schultz's reading the names, whereupon we would ask each individual to come forward, and it will be my privilege to give him or her, that is to say you, a certificate recognizing induction into the Pro Bono Society. Thank you, Dean Kearney. I always need to take a moment here to thank Dean Kearney and to thank Josh Gimbel for all of the support that both of you give to the Office of Public Service. It's really with your vision and your ongoing support to the programs, to me, to Katie, in Josh's case, to volunteering his time at the clinics, um, that, that allows all of our clinics to exist. You are why we have an Office of Public Service um, and pro bono programming here, so thank you. Students, I always need to take a minute also to talk to all of you. Um, those of you who are continuing as students, I hope that I get to continue working alongside you. And I really encourage you to think of this event as the beginning of your pro bono involvement, the beginning um, of knowing. It's proof that you can make a commitment to doing pro bono work. It's proof that you can integrate pro bono into your practice. Um, I hope that all of you forever keep a corner on your desk that is just set aside for pro bono. It matters, and it makes a huge dent, as we heard just in the numbers now, but it, as you know, working with clients, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Um, so stick with it. The other thing I have to mention is that there's a new incentive for lawyers to do pro bono work. So those of you who are going on to graduate and will soon be sworn in, you can now, in the state of Wisconsin, <laughs> receive some CLE credit, continuing legal education credit, in exchange for doing pro bono work. So you can worry about the details of that in a few years from now. You don't have to continue or to start your CLE requirements immediately. But come to me with questions about that. And I remain a resource for all of you as you graduate from law school and, of course, as you continue through law school, as you figure out how, what pro bono is going to look like in your career. Because um, you will keep doing it. <clears throat> I insist on it. <laughs> So now, as I read your name, please do come forward and accept a certificate from Dean Kearney acknowledging your pro bono accomplishments. All rise, or some people rise. Please move down here. <laughs> okay. Donald Applegate. Okay. Donald, thank you. Samuel Azinger. Sam, well done. Jasmine Baynard. Austin Borton. Austin, thank you. Courtney Brank. Courtney, thank you. Sean Brown. That's <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Budzine. Thank you. Joseph Bukowski. Michael Sinto. Margot Clark. Thank you. Robert Copley. Robert. Thank you. 
Veronica Corcoran. Courtney Creekmore. Aaron Davis. Prashant Dial. Allison Dykeman. Matthew Dobby. Frederick Dorr, the third. Andrew Duff. Brandy Dupree. Karen Durkin. Alyssa Gamine. Megan Gleis. Jonathan Gourlay. Elizabeth Grabo. Shelly Grasso. Aaron Haller. Megan Harmon. Emily Harriman. Emily Hartsink. Jessica Hendrick. Kyle Johnson. Ryan Jordan. John Josephson. Stephen Kaminsky. Kelsey Kerr. Alicia Court. Haley Krasnick. Elizabeth Kalinsky. April Cutts. Kristen Kuzniar. Natalie Lewandowski. Caitlin Lewis. Emily Lowe. Ben Lucarelli. Jillian Lukens. Omar Malcolm. Alan Mazula. Patrick McDonald. John McNally. Laura Mikeworth. Andrew Mung. Carla Nettleton. Sadie Olson. Mohammed Awaynot. Kayla Palaka. Nicholas Prudenzano. Nicholas Ramos. Sarah Ratezak. Annette Rausch. Matthew Richer. Colin Robinson. Courtney Rolance. Samuel Simpson. Thank you. Ashley Smith. Thank you. 
Matthew Soden. Nicholas Sulpizio. Miranda Teller. Bailey Ann Timmons. Naomi Tovar. Rachel Truer. C. King Say. Christina Wabaszewski. Hannah Zacharias. Thank you, everyone. So that concludes our program. I do want to extend, even though I already have, this is a celebration. I can say thank you more than once, I believe. <laughs> a warm thank you to all who have been involved in this. Certainly that does include Angela Schultz and Katie Mertz. And certainly it includes Mike Goucher and Shante Parker. Josh Gimbel and the Posner Foundation, and it includes any number of others who are not here, but who have helped us build this program at Marquette University Law School. I had occasion recently to be going through some old papers from the spring of 2002, and that was the term when Howard Eisenberg quite unexpectedly passed away. And we remember him at the law school as well. The work of the Office of Public Service, in fact, unfolds insofar as it happens at the law school in the Howard B. Eisenberg suite. So we really do have a great tradition at the law school. At the same time, uh, it's only a tradition to the extent that people go out and do it. And so that's why I said the work of the Office of Public Service and so far it unfolds at the law school occurs in the Howard B. Eisenberg suite. In fact, the great work of the Office of Public Service, the great work of this program, the legacy of Howard Eisenberg, Josh, Pos Josh Gimbel, I meant to say Gene Posner, uh, and others, uh, unfolds in our community. And it unfolds there because all of you go out and you do things. Um, I am not as articulate or as eloquent on that particular point as Shante was. I don't remember whether it was number two or number three uh, on um, Mike's list, but the blog post is uh, out there, as I understand it, for uh, people to read. Uh, and so we are very pleased to uh, claim Shante now as a new member of the Mark Hill Law School community. And uh, she's nodding her head yes, because all of you have demonstrated uh, what a tremendous place it is. So um, my thanks to you. We're going to have a reception out in the Zilber Forum. Uh, and we hope that you will stay around. I, understand there might be a test or two next week uh, in which some of you are interested. Um, that is, I will say, such an impressive thing about our program. As people came up here, you know, I thought to myself, well, I saw this person in the moot court competition, or I saw that person on the law review. I even saw a person or two in my advanced civil procedure class. Um, uh, I'll have to assign more reading next year just to try to even out the scales a little bit. Um, uh, all right, I know, I should have stopped. I never should add lib. Everything should be scripted. Uh, let's go outside and have a celebration. Thank you. <laughs>